Hi, everyone. Hi. Nice to be with you today. Um, so yeah, I'm a professor at Nairobi University, just down the hill. It's my first time speaking at CU, so it's nice to be here. The founder of our university was actually a Tibetan monk who taught here at CU, so we have a nice kind of relationship historically. Um, as Hannah mentioned, we have a program in yoga studies, a master's program that we recently launched in 2020. And so my own expertise is really on pre-modern Indian religions and pre-modern yoga. I'm a Sanskrit scholar. I read many yogic texts. And that's kind of where I'm most comfortable. Um, so modern yoga, or modern postural yoga, which developed within colonial India, is a little outside of my expertise. But since I've been developing this program and really looking at the entire history of neuro, uh, not Europa, but yoga studies of yoga, uh, I've learned a lot about this particular period. And I think that given my background, I can also address this thing that Anna raised, which is this is an indigenous physical discipline. And how can we understand the continuity between pre-modern traditions of yoga and what emerged in the colonial period? So I just want to plant that as a seed for something to think about. It's a question that's alive for a lot of people who are yoga teachers, who own yoga studios. What's the relationship between what we're doing, what we're teaching, and the history of yoga in India, the source? What levels of continuities are there? What levels of discontinuity? So these are some kind of big picture questions. This is uh, Iyengar, one of the most influential popularizers of modern postural yoga in front of the Taj Mahal. I just thought it was kind of a compelling image. <laughs> so before I actually dive into the colonial period, I just want to give a very superficial look at pre modern yoga. A lot of these points are not known by most people who practice yoga. I see this kind of framework as a fundamental literacy, and I don't have time to spell it out. Really, to re appreciate Primana Yoga, you have to come to a master's. <laughs> you know, it's vast. Um, I can say, even before I go into these points, though, that the, the earliest usage of the term yoga in a text is from around 1500 BCE. In that context, it had nothing to do with psychosomatic disciplines. It had to do with hitching a chariot to a horse. The earliest evidence of something like meditative disciplines that come to be known as yoga is probably around the 8th century BCE. So this idea that yoga is 5,000 years old, that some people kind of bandy around and share this idea, it's based on this seal from the Indus Valley Civilization, which predated the Vedic period, which actually does go back 5,000 years. And on that seal, there's this seated figure who looks like he's in a yoga pose. And that interpretation of that seal is basically the reason people say yoga is 5,000 years old. Nonetheless, yoga has been around for many when I speak about yoga, though, I'm saying it in the singular. So the first kind of foundational thing to understand about pre-modern yoga is that there's many, many forms of yoga. There's no single tradition of yoga. This, is, this itself is clarifying, right? I can assure you that if you go to um, a gym and you take a yoga class, what you're doing in that class has almost nothing to do with the earliest forms of yoga. So there's an interesting story about how this tradition developed. But the first thing is that it's not a tradition, it's many traditions. And those traditions span many religions. This is another thing. Often people think yoga is a Hindu religious form. This is especially true in uh, current India, where the Prime Minister Narendra Modi celebrates International Yoga Day and really sees it as this gift of the Hindu nation. And so there's a kind of Hindu nationalism tied to this identification. 
And interestingly, on the other side, it's also related to the paranoia of many Christians in the West about their people taking a yoga class and being indoctrinated into Hinduism. So you have this really interesting <laughs> dynamic on both sides. If you actually look at the history of yoga, you see that not only did uh, many different Buddhist lineages teach yoga, but that Buddhism was actually really important for potentially the author of the Yoga Sutras, kind of genetic material of this foundational text on yoga, the Yoga Sutras, deeply embedded to early Buddhism. And then Hatha Yoga, which is more physical yoga, which developed in medieval India, also deeply embedded to Buddhism and Hinduism, and different forms of Hinduism. In addition, Jains, the Jain religion that um, emerged in South Asia, has many texts on yoga and teachings on yoga. And even Muslims and Sufis who were living in India translated texts on yogas and developed Islamic forms of yoga. This is all in the pre-modern world. And of course today, we do actually have Christian yoga every day. <laughs> but just historically, this is a foundational point. The other thing is that there's many goals to these different forms of yoga. The classic two are liberation, kind of freedom from conditioning, freedom from samsara, the cyclical existence of the world and the universe. Another one is empowerment. There's a lot of yogic practices, they describe different powers uh, that can be received through the practice. So this, I mean, some of them are quite magical and others are just about having more agency in the world. Um, there's also in Hatha Yoga, which I'll talk a little bit more about as well, because it's really the transition to modern postural yoga, there's this notion that yoga uh, has many purifying aspects, that there's these cleansing methods. And they even use the language of Ayurveda, traditional Indian medicine, to describe which organs are cleansed, which channels are cleansed, how does yoga actually heal. This is going to become very important, of course, for how yoga is appreciated and understood today. So this idea of a therapeutic physical discipline is already there in pre-modern yoga, but I would argue that it's never the main goal. The main goal is usually more religious. It was about freedom from suffering, traditionally, or empowerment, different forms of empowerment. Um, I can say more about that, but I'm going to discipline myself, uh, apply yoga to the situation. One of the meanings of yoga has many meanings. One is, one of my favorites actually is just discipline. Um, because I find that that meaning of yoga as discipline has probably the broadest application. To be a yogi is to be someone who's extraordinarily disciplined. There's other meanings too. Yoga is union, yoga is yoking, there's things. Okay. When we look, how do you navigate this vast universe of different yogas, one might ask. One of the ways to do it is to look at what's the medium of the practice. Is it practiced with the body? Is it practiced with the breath? Is it practiced with the mind? Is it practiced with the imagination? Is it practiced at the level of awareness? Now, many yogas, I used this term psychosomatic earlier, many yogas involve the mind and the body, right? However, one of the ways to really appreciate and kind of assess any given form of yoga in pre-modern India is what is the emphasis? Is it body-based? Is it mind-based? Is it consciousness-based? Is it breath-based? Okay, this is an important thing to know. The majority of that pre-modern history of yoga, yoga was primarily meditative techniques done while seated on the floor, on the ground. The original meaning of asana, which means posture, was simply seated posture. So the majority of the history of yoga has really been about meditative techniques. However, again, it's with hatha yoga. Have you ever heard this term, Hatha Yoga? 
Hatha means force, but it's it's a common term for yoga. Hatha yoga is really the tradition within pre-modern India that introduces non-seated postures. It's also the tradition where the body, where it's the most body-based. And so posture and the body is really the foundation of, pra foundation of practice, although they also have pranayama, which is really central. This is breath practice, breath control. Really important in the text. They also have um, different forms of meditation, deep meditative absorption, samadhi. Okay, um, many mediums of practice. Yoga traditions are both internally diverse and dynamic. So this is like the final piece to basic literacy of the history of yoga. When I say Patanjali's yoga, that's often called classical yoga. It's a meditative form of yoga. It teaches the Ashtanga, the eight limbs of yoga. Very famous teaching. That's sometimes called Patanjali yoga or classical yoga. Then you could say, well, there's yoga in the Upanishads. That's even earlier than that. Or there's yoga in the <coughs> Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is probably the most famous text in the history of Hinduism. That's also earlier than Patanjali. And you could say, oh, there's yoga in the Puranas, these public texts that are about the worship of Shiva and Vishnu and temples. Then you could say, oh, there's yoga in these classical tantric traditions. And that's where you get the development of chakras and kundalini and all of these different things that are part of popular yoga discourse. Then you say, okay, there's Hatha Yoga. I've been talking about that a lot, right? Each one of those traditions doesn't teach one yoga. <laughs> so, in, I'll give you an example. Hatha Yoga, it's, there's three phases of it. There's early Hatha Yoga, classical Hatha Yoga, and late Hatha Yoga. Even within those, each one of those, there's a lot of internal diversity. One way to think about this with Hatha Yoga is today, just, just so you can get a sense, how many of you have taken the yoga class? <laughs> okay, almost all of you. Um, so today there's many systems of yoga, and there's many teachers, and a lot of the teachers are developing their own sequences. And some of them are even like, you know, putting TM next to their sequence, right? And so you have a kind of proliferation of yoga styles, yoga manuals, right? A similar kind of, and they're very different from one another. You have hot yoga, you have power yoga, you have yin yoga, you have yoga nidra, you have, you know, it goes from everything from like, oh, you have yoga for cultivating a beach body, right? You have goat yoga, you have naked yoga, you have hip hop yoga. I could go on, right? Yoga therapy. A similar thing was happening in pre-modern India. You just have this proliferation of different manuals, different systems of yoga. And they're not all under one school or one tradition. So part of taking in this history is just taking in this vast diversity. Okay. Any questions on pre-modern yoga? We'll, we can, uh, I want to save questions for the end, maybe, but any questions now on anything I've said, just to make sure that's clear so far. So when we come to the colonial context, we're really coming to, um, we're starting in the mid 19th century. Originally the British East India Company had a very powerful presence in India in the 19th century. And that shifted in around 1858 with a rebellion that happened against the British East India Company. After that rebellion, the British Raj took over India. And that is really the beginning, you could say, of the colonial moment of British colonialism in India, around 1859. Now, the Queen of England at that time declared herself the Empress of India. And there was a gesture. There was a, India was a really strategic place for the British Empire because it allowed trade with China and related to opium trade. It was just a strategic position. But also, India at that time the most recent empire was the Mughal Empire. The word mu Mughal is the source for the word mogul. If you say a business mogul, it means someone who's very powerful and has a lot of money. The Mughal Empire was the richest empire in the world during its time. And so England had a deep financial interest in India. In fact, they even described India as the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. 
And at this time, one of the most powerful things that the British government did, the British Raj did in India, is transform the educational systems and introduce British education. And part of that education was physical education. However, in doing that, at least in the places where they were established, and here I'm thinking Calcutta, New Delhi, some of these major cities that were their strongholds, the forms of schooling they had were basically the forms of British schooling that were alive at that time, but they pretty much discounted and disqualified all tradition, traditional forms of Indian knowledge. Now, South Asia at this time is a massive civilization with an incredible history and a deep history of its own systems of knowledge and education, traditional forms of education. Those were basically um, disqualified overnight. And this had a huge impact. Um, what's ironic about this disqualification is that there was many different tools within their discourse to actually evaluate knowledge and see if it's valid based on modern you know, principles of assessment. None of these were applied. You could look, for example, and do empirical studies of Ayurveda or of yoga and see, are these valuable things to continue within the, within the education of Indians? But they never did that. Because it was associated with India, there was this kind of stigma on the entire thing. And that was part of the justification for their presence. It's a project of civilization, right? Of introducing a more advanced civilization in order to move India forward. Um, okay. In order to appreciate how this applies to physical education and eventually yoga, I need to actually back up a little. And I imagine some of this stuff might have emerged in some of your other classes. I'd be curious if you feel the overlap. Um, Scandinavian gymnastics. Um, there was this, Per Henrik Ling was this incredible innovator of gymnastic systems. And Ling gymnastics had a huge influence beyond Sweden, beyond Scandinavia. Um, and one of the developers of his system was Tissot, a French um, physical culturist. And he developed medical gymnastics, or the movement cure. And this idea of medical gymnastics was using gymnastics as a way to conquest disease through movement. He had this idea that through movement itself, and specific gymnastic regimens, and forms of calisthenics, you can basically heal the body. There's also, also a notion What's that? Doesn't that still exist? Like it a lot does. Of teams and doctors yes. Know these A yeah, absolutely. It do different forms of this still exist. And, and there's incredible like wave that this started off in terms of a lot of different notions of um, physical practice as a mode of cure, a certain like new thought and nature cure. Like there's a whole kind of cluster of ideas. Um, one of the ideas that, that was foundational to this form of physical discipline was that you're trying to develop the whole person. And this prefigures what we find in a lot of discourse around physical culture in the 18th and 19th century. There was this emphasis on the harmony between the mind, body, and spirit. Again, you're not just cultivating the body. It's not just about having a healthy body. It's about transforming the mind. And it's also about a kind of, there's, this is often tied in deeper spiritual and religious ideas about transformation. Not only that, um, there's also a notion that there's a moral transformation that's happening. This is really key. Um, this form of gymnastics was integrated into the British military and into British in, in, uh, education systems in the 1900s. The British adopted Ling gymnastics completely. This is why it arrived in India. And it's particularly associated with the YMCA. Have you been talking about the YMCA at all? A little? 
Okay, YMCA has a fascinating history in India. I grew up going to the Y, so I've always been curious about this deeper history of the Y. Um, but also the Salvation Army. However, in the 19th century, there were other physical systems, and there's even an idea of like a battle of different systems. Within Europe, this is happening. And German systems, developed by Johann Gutsmuth and Frederick John, they often had a lot of different props, and this is kind of the foundation of a lot of modern gymnastics. And in these German systems of physical culture that were competing with the Scandinavian ones, there's this notion of the cultivation of a body for regenerating moral metal, for ethical development, and also for the cultivation of national brawn. <laughs> you know, this idea of being, becoming a new German, right? So it was tied to certain nationalistic ideas of the strength you cultivate through these practices relates to your kind of brawn or power as a citizen. So there's, that's, that's also kind of brewing. And then there's this notion of muscular Christianity. Is this something you've explored at all? No? Oh, cool. I didn't know about muscular Christianity <laughs> until I did research. I mean, I've, I've heard about some of these trends, but there's basically, muscular Christianity is this socio-religious movement it was trying to instill these very masculine ideas of courage, selfless service, moral character development, all through exercise, all through fitness, all through strength building, right? And it's kind of ironic, you know, they even, given that, you know, Jesus himself wasn't like a great athlete or something, that you have this sudden notion within the Christian tradition of like building strength as the most Christian thing you can do. Right? Um, it was connected to eugenics, um, which, you know, is this idea of by developing the body and becoming strong, you're actually improving the collective national or racial body. So some of these really questionable ideas around eugenics were also a part of this discourse. But very important, it was tied to the notion in England of empire building of building a colonial power. Um, so, with, but within the context of Christianity, it's, it's kind of framed as a battle cry against all sinfulness and against those who stand in the way of English greatness. So, I have British roots. Um, it turns out my family, my mom was born in England. I have family that was actually a part of the British Raj, I found out recent years, which is ironic because my wife's from India, I've dedicated my entire life to studying India, so it's just interesting to hear these discourses for me and know that, yes, this comes from my tradition. <laughs> right? um, so, this, these notions were essential to the YMCA. I, I don't know if you know, the YMCA is originally a Christian organization. Um, that had a very huge presence in India that we'll get into deeper. But there's this interesting development that I just want to throw in before we get there, which is that one of the responses of Indians was to actually create a revival of their own forms of fitness, their own forms of physical culture. And when they did this, they actually borrowed a lot of the ideas and values from muscular Christianity, interesting. And so, you know, this swell of physical culture that was happening in India, this kind of, suddenly you get in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, all of these gymnasiums being found, founded, and they're trying to develop and trying to reconnect with what is our own form of indigenous gymnastics? What are our own forms of physical culture? However, which can make us strong, so we can, and this is, then becomes tied to the independence movement, so we can break the chains of our colonizers. And so muscular Christianity, ironically, contributed to the emergence of regional nationalisms that were anti-colonial. 
Now this is interesting because it complicates a simple binary between colonizer and colonized. But it's, it's just fascinating to, to kind of build this context and appreciate this milieu because it's within this milieu that modern postural yoga is born. Okay, there's just this fascinating concurrence that I discovered in my research. It happened in 1896. 1896 was the first modern Olympics. Have you talked about that? <laughs> yeah. I think I saw that that was part of the talks that you've seen, right? Mm -hmm. In the same year, Swami Vivekananda published the book Raja Yoga. Now, Swami Vivekananda, who's pictured here, is one of the first Indian teachers, not the first, but the most influential to come to America. He came to Chicago in the 1890s. He gave this talk at the World Fair that was happening there, and it just wowed everybody. He established an organization called the Vedanta Society in America. He's a part of this beginning of this wave of many different Hindu teachers, yogis, meditation masters, gurus coming to America. This really picked up in 1965 with the changing of immigration laws in America. So, but the period between the 1890s and 1965 there's a lot of great scholarship on it. There was actually a lot of different people teaching yoga who were from India in America at that time. So this book was one of the most influential books of the time. It was read all over Europe, all over America, all over India. It's basically a translation of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras with Swami Vivekananda's commentary. Interestingly, Swami Vivekananda critiques physical yoga and hatha yoga. And he defines yoga more as meditation. And so, parallel to this stream of modern postural yoga, there's another stream that's very important, which is modern meditative yoga. And Swami Vivekananda was one of the pioneers of that in the West. It's the same year as well that the uh, journal Laplet, excuse the French pronunciation, <laughs> was first published. So it's this time where there's this explosion of interest in athletics, in sports, and that's happening now at a kind of global scale. All right. Um, now, I mentioned that modern postural yoga emerges in this time. How do we understand what modern postural yoga is? The um, an acronym is MPY, okay? Modern postural yoga. That's a very useful distinction. If you just say yoga, it's hard to know what you're talking about. But if you say modern postural yoga, you're talking about this traditional yoga class as we imagine it colloquially in our minds, right? Um, a lot of scholars who work on this don't know about pre-modern yoga, but they understand modern postural yoga as a hybridized product of, colonials Indian, of colonial India's dialogical encounter with worldwide physical culture movement. And many of the pioneers of modern postural yoga in India, we're going to meet one of them shortly, really see this postural practice, this asana, as an indigenous, democratized form of Indian gymnastics, requiring no apparatus like those German forms of gymnastics. So in this sense, it's closer to the Ling system and the Swedish calisthenics. You, can, you don't need a whole gym with setups to do this, right? You can just go and do the practice. I mean, maybe you need a yoga mat, right? That's like the main apparatus. And now we have bolsters and straps and other things. But not, no major apparatus. So it allowed yoga to be practiced all over very easily. And comparable in function and goal to Western physical culture. They were interested in it in terms of developing strength, in terms of healing and its therapeutic benefits, in terms of moral cultivation, and this they drew on their earlier text in certain ways to find their own ethical framework, right? And they, of course, in, in the face of this massive critique coming from colonialism, which also ties to a deeper European notion that's very important, which is the stereotype that 
Indians were more effeminate than European, Europeans. That Indian culture was passive. That Indian men were more feminine. Right? There's a number of stereotypes about India that were tied to these discourses of muscular Christianity. And so in some sense, there's this response that's saying, not only did we have our own indigenous physical fitness systems, but they were better than yours. <laughs> right? So, okay. Now, what, again, at this time, the YMCA was having a huge impact in India. And there's, they were really one of the most important, like a lot of the notions of physical fitness and culture that were circulating in the Y had to do with this notion of increasing one and strengthening one's body, mind, and spirit. And they inculcated in young people the ideals, value structures, and behavioral pa patterns implicit in the Christian way of life. So this was a big part, you could say, of like the colonial project. And you see this as well in other areas of, uh, of the British colonial power, is the introduction of sports, the introduction of all of these different things. Um, as a way of taming and you know strengthening the colonized people based on this model that's coming from the wrong value system. And there's this one of the um, really important figures within the Y was Harry Buck. He set up the first school for YMCA Indian physical directors. So he was training directors to go out and open Ys and run different YMCAs. He was also, this is really important, he was very creative. He actually took postural yoga and integrated it into the Y. And when he did that, he really saw the Y as promoting asana, as this kind of indigenous physical form, as a component of the overarching ethos of Christian piety. So they were actually Christianizing this form of Indian yoga. They were seeing it as leading to greater Christian piety. So it was actually tied to their missionary work, it was introducing yoga. And Swami Kubalayananda is a really important pioneer of yoga. And in many ways, he saw his own work as a response to this, as kind of reclaiming yoga, tied to a deeper Hindu revival of this physical culture. Um, I just want to give you a little background on this figure. If there's anything, I think it's just important to appreciate his, his life. I would say within, when it comes to modern postural yoga, there's four major pioneers. Swami Kuvalayananda, Krishnamacharya. Krishnamacharya is the one who taught Atabi Joyce and Iyengar, who probably had the most impact on yoga globally of anyone alive. But he also taught this Russian woman who became an American Indra Devi, who was one of his students, who then went and taught yoga in China, first people, first person to ever teach in China, and then taught in LA, open studios in LA, uh, and taught many different Hollywood stars in the 1950s and 1960s, and then she brought yoga to South America. There's a whole book on her life. It's fascinating. <laughs> um, so Swami Kubalayananda, Krishnamacharya, I, I could give five lectures on him and his importance. Um, Swami Shivananda from Rishikesh. He has a whole school that he helped found. Um, and Sri Yogendra, who is another physical culturalist in Mumbai. Um, my wife was from Mumbai, actually went and did her yoga teacher training at the place in Santa Cruz. It's been there since the early 1900s. I met the daughter of Sri Yogendra and it's really nice to actually go visit that yoga shala, that place where they do a lot of research. Okay, these are these four figures are incredibly influential. Um, so, Kuvali Ananda graduated from Baroda University in 1910. He was heavily influenced by Aurobindo Ghosh, who was an independence activist and also a philosopher and a sage. He became Sri Aurobindo, and so. He decided at a young age to dedicate his life 
to the cause of nationalist activism, social service, and freedom. He was a principal at a college which was actually shut down by the British in 1920. The reason for shutting down the college that he was the principal at was that the college was promoting national agitation and anti-colonial sentiments. A lot of his teachings resonate with this idea of muscular Christianity, but they're really based on his own recovery of yoga philosophy rather than Christianity. Um, he studied in 1919 with this Maharaja, an uh, uh, Indian king, who taught him, gave him formal and extensive training in Hatha Yoga and these different practices. And he opened the Kaivalya Dhamma Institute, which is just outside of Mumbai, in this really beautiful area in Lonavla, in 1924. And the key focus of his work at this institute was the scientific study of yoga. He's one of the earliest people to do the scientific study of yoga globally. What he was searching for was a rational explanation for the physiological effects of yoga postures and breath practice. And for the development of yoga therapies to treat specific diseases. Why was he so interested in science? Because if he could establish yoga through the discourse of science, it would allow him to show the British, the inherent value. He adopted the language, right, that could prove the inherent value of a system. And he conducted many, many experiments. In this sense, this is one of his most innovative contributions. Actually, in 1920, he did his first experiments in a state hospital in Baroda, testing the effects of yoga on blood pressure, digestion, circulation, the nervous system, respiration. Um, he also looked, and it's, it's really interesting, I mean, it, it'd actually be worthwhile to go back and like, because now there's a lot more research on yoga related to the mindfulness movement and research on meditation. So in some sense, he was way ahead of all of this. But it'd actually be go interesting to go back and look at his studies and see like their enduring value and how they might be compared with studies today. Um, I have a lot of students who explore the scientific study of yoga. Um, so, one of the things he did is he, he also created a course, a series of asanas and breath practices, mudras, which are also certain postures where you hold bandhas, different binds, kriyas, different physical activities and repetitive motion. And he published this in this journal called Yoga Mimans. And in it, he distinguished between meditative poses therapeutic poses and cultural poses. And he made this really interesting distinction. He said that, look, when it comes to yoga, our own indigenous physical culture, there's physical, there's people who are looking for healing and physiolog physiological advantages, and then there's people who are anxious to secure spiritual advantages. He made this really useful distinction. Some people do yoga just for the physical benefit. Other people do it for spiritual reasons, right? I think that's pretty much how a lot of people feel today. <laughs> but he came up with names for these people. He said the people who just do it for their body are physical culturalists, and the people who do it for spiritual benefit are spiritual culturalists. Interesting. Um, OK, so here is uh, him actually doing some of his research. Another really interesting thing is um, Dise Muzumdar, or Mujumdar, a Marathi um, scholar who put together this encyclopedia of Indian physical disciplines between 1936 and 1949, called the Vyayam Janakosh. And it was written in Marathi. It was later translated into English. It's on archive.org. You can go look at it. And what's interesting about this is that he, the purpose for creating it was to counteract the colonial perception that there was no physical tradition in India. And so what he did is he just went through all of these different sources. He looked at traditional Indian martial arts, traditional Indian wrestling, and of course yoga, and he comprehensively documented it. And interestingly, he's doing this with a very 
similar notion of masculine Christianity, or muscular Christianity, this notion that by reconnecting with these roots, we can empower and strengthen our own national brawn, right, in order to become free of the British. But, but again, there's this shift. Instead of placing faith in a Christian God, there's faith is being placed in the potential for an Indian nation, which finally did emerge, of course, with Indian independence in 1948. Um, and this particular image is really interesting. This is called Malkam, and it's a, it's a traditional sport that wrestlers do for training. The pole actually represents their opponent, and they do different positions, uh, dynamic positions on the pole. And there's also rope Malkam, and there's even a connection with yoga, because some of the positions they do on the rope or on the pole are kind of like similar to yogic postures. But the idea was that it was a strength training for traditional wrestling, which goes back centuries in India, and is different from wrestling in the West. Um, my wife grew up doing Malkam, interestingly. So, and Malkam has, plays a really interesting role in the formulation of Mahapashra Yoga, too. How, how do you spell that? Um, Malakam, M-A-L-L-A, and then K-H-A-M-B. Or just, sometimes it's written together just with one L. And they, they just had like the first international competition in Hong Kong, too. It's a really interesting sport. Okay. It's really, I'm almost done. It's really in the, um, the middle of the 20th century that we see yoga explode worldwide. And it's this time that we really see the formulation of what we call the natural structure of a yoga class. This kind of standard international modern Pasha Yoga classroom format really takes shape. I mentioned Indra Devi. This is actually an LP record of her giving yoga instructions from uh, 1963. <laughs> um, here's Krishnamacharya, who I told you about, who trained Iyengar, who trained Patavi Joyce, Ashtanga Yoga, which is really the, most, the source for power yoga globally. Um, and it was also the teacher of Indra Devi. Here's uh, Swami Yogananda in California in the 1930s. Swami Yogananda met the president. He opened many different centers. He actually wasn't as focused on Hatha Yoga, but he had some component of it, components of it in his teaching. Um, it's a lovely picture. Uh, here's Swami Shivananda, another pioneer I mentioned in Rishikesh. This is the uh, Ganges, the Ganga River, right? He wrote a very influential yoga manual, and his, he had many different swamis under him. There went on to have this whole Shivananda School of Yoga, which is established. They have an ashram in Bahamas, they have one in Quebec. They're all over the world, a massive yoga school. So it's, it's really during the 20s, the 30s, 20s and 30s, the pioneers are teaching. 40s and 50s is really when you have this explosion of yoga globally. Um, and this relates to a number of other things that are happening in the post-war period, post-World War II, especially in America, but all over Europe. Um, why did yoga, why did this indigenous form of practice become so popular? How did it become, and I kid you not, a billion dollar, a multi-billion dollar industry in the world? Um, during this time, there was a lot of research on stress, specifically related to urban living. And there's a scholar, Elizabeth A. McKellis, who wrote this book on the history of modern posture yoga, and she argues that this relationship between interest in stress and different physical practices and disciplines to relieve stress, especially in urban areas, helps explain why most yoga studios are found in cities. It's not random, okay? And in fact, she even goes as far as to say that one of the fundamental defining characteristics of modern postural yoga is addressing stress. It's de-stressing. Interesting. Related to all of these forms of modern living. Um, there's also this relationship 
that we've been exploring this whole talk, which is yoga as fitness, right? As a form of fitness. This is also why we find yoga in gyms as well. So some people may choose to do yoga as a spiritual practice, but yoga, as it's embodied, Manakashra yoga, has become a form of fitness. Is it a sport? I don't know. I don't think so, actually. I don't think it's technically a sport, right? So this is an interesting thing to consider, too. Is yoga a sport? I know sports is like part of what we're looking at here. So it's, it's an open question. For the most part, it has not been identified as a sport. It's not a it's definitely not a competitive. Well, actually, it can be competitive. <laughs> right? Like in a yoga studio, when people are looking at other people and be like, oh, they can't do that. That's the first thing you're going to do. It's don't, don't be competitive. competitive. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, another thing about it, it's, it's a do-it-yourself form of spiritual practice. And so there's room for the practitioner to, to decide, actually, is it spiritual or is it just totally secular? Right? This freedom is a huge for its success in the West. It doesn't come with any commitment to a religion, any initiations, right? There's no one doctrine. It's utterly free of any doctrine. And this actually, we actually see in pre-modern India, this notion that it doesn't matter what your religious background is. It doesn't matter what your beliefs are. If you do the practice, it works. Just do the practice. That, that actually is taught in the 12th century CE. So there's, an, there's already a precedent of a universal practice that can be applied by people from any tradition, and that is absolutely essential to the success of yoga. And then she adds, this is Elizabeth de Michaelis, who has these great insights, she adds a third dimension, and this is probably the most important for its success. She describes modern Pashra yoga as a healing ritual of secular religion. A healing ritual of secular religion. Why? Because it gives people access to the sacred. However they decide to interpret that, and how does it do that? It's because of the ritualistic structure, she argues. How does that ritual structure work? Like many other rituals, you go to the studio, you take your shoes off. You lead your feet with your shoes. You come onto your mat. You don't walk on other people's mat, but your mat is a sacred space. The, you submit yourself to the teacher, right? You become passive. You allow the teacher to guide you. Sometimes the teacher speaks beyond just the mechanics of the postures and speaks about how this relates to other aspects of life. You always begins with a quiet voice. All of these things cue that you're leaving your, your normal conventional world behind and entering into this rarefied space. And then what do you do at the end of a class? Shavasana, right? Corpse pose. You literally die. Right? You, you mimic death. You die to your own self. To do what? To reintegrate the benefit of the practice into your life after. This structure is very powerful, and a lot of people are transformed by it, not just physically. I had a friend, just to give a great example, who was like a mixed martial arts fighter, and I went to high school with him, and he was like scary. And one day he was in, he took a yoga class, and he was in Shavasana, and his heart exploded with love. He went and became a yoga teacher, trip teacher, dedicated his life and he like turned into this like the Hindu god Hanuman, he reminds me of that, like this muscular, strong, like yoga, like so passionate about yoga. And that's all he does now is he teaches yoga internationally. He's no longer a mixed martial it all happened in one moment. Right? So this is part this is part of the power of Manapasha Yoga. Um, it's also helpful that there's a lack of pressure to commit to any doctrine, as I mentioned. There's this notion of cultivating the self, a kind of privatized form of spirituality, which fits really well with our kind of Protestant-based secular ideology. Um, highly suitable to the demands of developed societies, blah, 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 lots of things one could say. Okay. Um, So I put these, these are yogis, right, in Pramana in India. I want to conclude with this slide because how did this 
<laughs> you know, how did this, like, how did this <laughs> become what we think of yoga when you hear the word today, right? It's, I haven't had time to tell you the whole story, but in terms of some general, like, conclusions, and then I'll leave you with some seeds for future reflection and study if you're curious. Um, in some ways, the creation of modern postural yoga was an admixture of rejection of the physical culture being imposed upon them by the British and assimilation of some of the values and even some of the practices that came from Swedish calisthenics, different gymnastic regimens, etc., and different forms of dance, which I didn't have time to go into. At that time, there was no, in the early 19, you know, 10s and 20s, there's no system or brand of physicalized yoga that could, that these pioneers could point to. And so, it had to be created out of what was available, including a large number of exercises that had not previously been considered a part of yoga, related to the nature cure, the movement cure, therapeutic gymnastics, calisthenics, bodybuilding, and so when colonial India built her own program of physical culture, one of the names she gave it is yoga. That's from Mark Singleton, this really great book uh, called The Yoga Body, which I gave you a chapter of for the reading. Um, however, since Singleton wrote that conclusion, another scholar, Jason Birch, has done a lot of research on early modern yoga, pre-colonial yoga. And this is what I was speaking to earlier is late Hatha yoga. What's fascinating about this research is a few things. One, a lot of the things, a lot of the elements of modern postural yoga that we thought were borrowed potentially from Swedish calisthenics actually have been found in pre-modern Indian sources. Within the tradition of Hatha yoga, there was what's called a proliferation of asana. There was suddenly a centralization of asana that happened before the British arrived. Not only that, these asanas were arranged in different sequences. And there was supine asanas, seated asanas, standing asanas, and there was even dynamic movements associated with asanas. And this kind of leads into this exciting area of yoga studies is an emergent field where we're just starting to learn about these parts, these chapters of the history of yoga that just no one's really looked at. And so this goes back to the very first question I asked about continuity and discontinuity. Was modern postural yoga just a hybrid or does it have deeper continuity to these earlier physical yogas of pre-modern India? There's no clear answer, but I will say this. In pre-modern yoga, there is, to our knowledge, no vinyasa. And what vinyasa is, is the dynamic flow between postures. It seems like in the majority of pre-modern yoga, people just held a posture for different periods of time. They would then sometimes, in certain late texts, do a sequence, but it was not flowing. Where did this vinyasa come from? Well, if we go back to Krishnamacharya, one of the things he would do is he would do these exhibitions of yoga. And if you go and show to different places what yoga is, to just have someone in one posture for a long time doesn't make any sense. It's boring, right? So he would, he would count. And as he would count, they would shift postures. And this shifting of postures, this vinyasa, seemed to emerge at this time. Another thing, Surya Namaskar is sun salutation. It's one of the fundamental structures of any yoga class. Although people did bow to the sun in pre-modern India, that's what Surya Namaskara means, that sequence, you know, where this and forward bend and, you know, plank and upward dog and downward dog, we have not found it in any pre-modern text. Wow. We don't know where it comes from. And it's so fundamental. 
There's also many other poses that are very famous. I'm thinking now like Warrior Two, right? Not in any pre-modern yoga text, but many similar movements to that in European forms of gymnastics. So it's complicated, right? It's complicated, but what we found more recently is that there's more continuity than we knew about, which is really interesting. And of course, in addition to the question of asanas, I actually have my students do this. I'm like, you could take any one asana and do a history of that asana, right? What's the earliest text to teach it? You know, what are the different names that was given? Naming asanas too, another really interesting thing, right? Um, so, in addition to that though, there are all of these other practices in yoga, including breath practices. And many of those have deep, deep pedigree in pre-modern Indian yoga traditions. I'll give you an example. Alternate nostril breathing, I don't know if you've ever done this. You breathe in one, breathe out the other, breathe in one, breathe out the other. It's called Nadi Shodhana, purifies the channels. That is first taught in the sixth century CE. And it's just taught. It never goes away. This is a really powerful practice. We see it across all these traditions. So you can actually do this really interesting genealogy of different practices to start to get closer to an answer to that question. Okay. Thank you. We have 15 minutes for questions. So you almost answered my question, but I wonder if there's any more. A couple of us have been uh, from the different classes, um, noting the um, warlike military um, implications, and you said you know, that was part of this colonial resistance. And I was like, oh, yoga, and then you said warrior one and warrior two, and I was like, oh my gosh, there it is. Um, so when did that come into existence, that title? I know it's in um, Sanskrit, not, uh, and then are there any others that we could reflect on that uh, yeah, had more military? Yeah. In terms of Sanskrit, there's virasana. Vira means one of the, the word for warrior. And actually, uh, often it's like this. It's like this is viras. It's not these warrior one, warrior two that are the standing poses. Those we haven't found in pre-modern sources. So there are different ideals of warriorship, of course, in pre-modern India. And there's this interesting relationship between wrestling and different yoga practices, the uses of rope and the Malakam connection. Um, but where it came in was really in, I think, in the ninth, in, in this colonial mix. You have, one thing I didn't mention is within the edu Indian educational system, they have like these drills. And they got this from the British. They would do these drills, like classroom drills and military like drills. And a lot of the people who are pioneering yoga look down at the people who would do these drills as like a totally foreign, imposed thing. But I think where, where this idea of warriorship and yoga and strength and masculinity comes in was the way in which a lot of those values were kind of translated into a nationalist, anti-colonial project. And that's, and interestingly, yoga and you know, it never fully clicked as much as bodybuilding in that sense. And so when it came to like the school systems in India, there were places where you do yoga, there was yoga schools, but it never was really fully integrated into Indian school systems. And I think that's because there was more of a need for a warrior-like, strength-building, nationalistic notion. Um, but it did influence it in, in certain ways. And the last thing I'll say is that there is this interesting connection between yoga and kings. This idea of Raja Yoga, or Royal Yoga. And there's a, there is a comparison that the yogi is like a king. Again, it's not so much about physical power, but it's a kind of regalness. That comes from pre-modern India. It's a kind of power, a kind of temporal power, like a deep repose, casualness, spontaneity. Um, uh, Yogis are often described as maharajas, great kings, or great sovereigns. Even the Buddha, who is compared to an emperor, is called Chakravartin. But he was the emperor of Dharma. He wasn't the emperor of the political social world. So this kings, king, god, and yogis <laughs> are often 
in the tradition and the pre-modern traditions are often connected. Um, but the martial dimension, it wasn't really a part of yoga for most of its history. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if you've heard of uh, Alec Kenoja, who's a Harvard-trained uh, psychiatrist. He turned himself into like an internet personality. And it's like niches dealing with like uh, depressed video game players. Um, but one of the things that he talks about is how there's a tradition of, I guess you would call it like pre-modern yogis, um, who deal with sort of like the mental structures um, that in the West Freud excavates through like the entire history of Western yeah. literature. Yeah. And in terms of Kenoji, he's talking about how like in the tradition of these yogis, it's like they're actually discussing it in a like medical framework. Whereas in terms of Freud, it's like they're just stories and even excavating the psychological psychological concepts. And so what struck me in terms of what you're talking about is how like the trajectory of yoga's, I guess like the fusion into the West um, mirrors the development of psychoanalysis into psychology. And so I'm wondering like, um, is there any like scholarship on this? I mean, you kind of touch on it in terms of like post-World War II and stress, but like it seems yeah. like there's a, a larger trajectory here. There's a few things I could share. Um, one is that Patanjali Yoga Sutras, that particular system, there's centuries of commentary on that text, so it becomes a text tradition. And it's overemphasized in terms of its importance because there's many other yogas, but it is really important. And um, a lot of people have tried to look to it as a kind of a manual that, because because of that is a, a more of a meditative yoga that involves working with the mind, and also working with um, different forms of mental condition, and even the unconscious. He talks about samskaras, you know, these deep impressions that come from past experience that condition and obscure one's mind and cause suffering. And so people, have, now that we have all this language of psychology, people have been like, look, this is an incredible work of yoga psychology, right? And I think they're right. I mean, there's incredible insights. Whether that's medical or not, I mean, I don't think the yogis would say it's medical and that term is more of a modern term, right? But it is empirical because it's based on centuries of observation of states of mind. But it's, it's not looking at the mind from the outside, it's looking at it from the inside. So another distinction you could say is it's more phenomenological, right? Um, and uh, this is true for a lot of Buddhist, the idea of Buddhist psychology as well, which we actually teach at Naropa University in our graduate school of counseling psychology, right? You have these incredibly deep traditions that just study the mind for centuries, and in the laboratory, you could say, of meditation. And so, yes, I think that's an incredible resource. And what's interesting is, it, in terms of the diffusion piece, um, Freud was somewhat interested in India and religion in its symbolic nature, but Jung was deeply interested in yoga, in specifically. He was interested in mandalas, he was interested in the chakra system. He wrote a lot about the chakra system. He was interested in kundalini, he wrote an essay. He met different scholars of Indian religions and yoga, and he really saw a lot of resources in the, you could say, like in the kind of symbolic universe of these traditions that speak to his own notions that were foundational to death psychology. Um, so there is some good scholarship on Jung. And what's interesting is, you know, he's writing at a time when there's still a lot of projection and not a lot of knowledge of these traditions. So some of it's romanticized, and some of it's he's just kind of taking it and using it for his own ends, you know. But a lot of it's really brilliant, and it's a really interesting moment of connection. And another thing that's in the mix at that time is the Theosophical Society. I don't know if any of you have heard of them, Madame Blavatsky. That they were this really influential um, group of spiritual teachers and institutions and organizations that are, are really kind of foundational to new age, the New Age. And a, a lot of the, theosophists were taking ideas from Jung, from psychology. You have like the birth of transpersonal psychology, yoga, Western esotericism, the occult, 
spiritualism. This, this is really cool when you look into this stuff in America. The kind of hotbed that yoga landed into. A foundation of New Age religion and spiritual but not religious, right? It's a whole esoteric jungle <laughs> where, where there's suddenly more interest in the relationship between psychology and spirituality and alternative health, alternative medicine, all of these things. Okay, I, I'm kind of going off, but. So there's a lot of really great things that you could look at to explore that further. Um, but I, just one last thought. Since I'm a Sanskrit scholar, since I read potentially in the original sources, I also think that it's we have this a lot of great scholarship on potential that no one reads. <laughs> and then there's all these popular teachings about, about it, right? So I actually think to recover like the insights of that for a modern yoga therapy should be based in really understanding the integrity. Of that, of those knowledge systems, and I think that can be really integral and really important, and very valuable. And I think the groundwork for that is actually starting to happen. So we're at the Rope University. We're looking into that, starting a new therapy program. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, and there's <clears throat> um, Krishna Macharya. So actually, yeah. So Krishna Macharya also had a nephew named Desikachar, and he did a lot of work with yoga therapy. Um, so there's also, within these pioneers, there's certain lineages where there's a lot of yoga therapy happening. But it's more like different asanas that can help you with different therapeutic applications. And it's less about what you were describing, which is like understanding the structure of mind, and even unconscious, or subconscious. Um, we talked about how indigenous sports have not really been diffused to the colonizer countries over the last day, and you kind of hinted that yoga, for a variety of reasons, has. Um, I'm wondering, and this is a little bit of a tangent, but I'm seeing in younger generations this idea of going back to a lot of Eastern ways of healing, whether it's like energy work or chakras or Reiki, I don't know if I'm saying that right, just all of these things that in my mind there would not be a lot of acceptance for, but younger generations are really taking to it. Do you think that that's because of some of the similar ideas that you mentioned with yoga in terms of like not being necessarily religious based? you can do it on your own? Or why is that, why have, why have younger generations here kind of taken to that, whereas like the sports aspect, that's also not religious, it also can be done some way. Yeah. yeah, I think that, you know, it's, it's a great example is there's a, some really good research on yoga in England. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's a long history of yoga in England, and it's got its own really quirky, fascinating history. And there's people studying yoga in Japan, yoga in Brazil, like this is cool. It's like a lot of really neat things. But England is an example of that, right? Like it returned to England, it came to England after the, from the colonial process, and then flourished there. And so interestingly, I would say like in America too, uh, if you study the history of America perceptions in India, just staying with the Indian spirituality or something. Mm -hmm. um, there's like, if you look at early newspapers from the 19 teens in America, there's a lot of anxiety based on this notion of a conservative Christian American perspective. Of these ideas influencing and corrupting Americans, right? That, we have to wrestle with that history. And a lot of that is racist, you know. Then there's this other history, which you see in certain groups like uh, the Unitarian Church, or the Universalist. It was the Unitarian Church that brought Swami Vivekananda to America. It was the Unitarian Church that opened all of these different dialogues. That's also a Christian-based church, 
but it's much more progressive. It was interested in other traditions and practices. It created dialogues. You know, it did a lot of service during World War II as well. Like it was really amazing history, the Unitarian Church. And then you have the counterculture of the 60s. And this, I think, is really key. It's really the counterculture that embraced Eastern spirituality more than anyone, right? And it's that was when the gurus from India and the Buddhist masters like Chogyam Trungpa, who founded Naropa, landed in America, their students were hippies, <laughs> often, right? And that is its own stream in, and I think the continuation of that counterculture in, if you, I'm interested in the history of music in America, if you look at like techno and raves, punk, right? Hip hop, right? These are all kind of countercultural, they grew out of the energy of rock and roll in the 60s, right? And it's really in that context that all of these things we've been discussing um, just flourished, took root, flourished. And so I think today there are young people who are identified with that. And whether they know about that history or not, it doesn't matter. It's just kind of like in their genes, you know? I think it's just the addressing an unique spirituality, but not wanting to be tied to any particular religion. So yeah. more of a secular experience, yeah. which I never thought about that. Yeah. And, and I was shocked when my son was in yoga in this um, pretty evangelical Korean Christian girlfriend. Said, I will not go to yoga. And he was like, what do you mean? <laughs> and she says, you know, that's idolatry. You're yeah. worshiping a Hindu tradition. So yeah. it was reassuring to hear you say that, because I'm like, well, where did that come from? <laughs> you know, yeah. So that stream's still alive too, yeah. you know, in, in con more conservative Christian context, it's still alive as well. So both those streams are still alive, is one way of saying it. And on the progressive side, SBNR is so important, spiritual but not religious. Did you know this is one of the growing identifiers for people? Are you, are you religious? What's your religion? Now in many of these surveys, SBNR is an option. And the percentage of people choosing spiritual but not religious is expanding, right? So, in that sense, yeah. And, and I could say a lot more about how even certain forms of Hinduism didn't see themselves as a religion. They saw themselves as a universal spirituality that anyone part of any religion could practice. This was the discourse of modern Hinduism that a lot of gurus were teaching. They were saying meditation doesn't belong to any religion, including Hinduism. Why not? Because neither does sleep. And when you go beyond the state of deep sleep to this deep meditation, that's, in, that's just inherent to all humanity. So there's this universalism tied to this that made like all of these teachings and traditions palatable and, you know, and, and created these sparks. I will say one thing about SBNR, spiritual but not religion. Um, by way of like a slight critique. I think that um, often it's a false dichotomy because there's an implicit idea that what religion is is just institutionalized dogma. And there's a crystallization of religion as that. And what spiritual means is I have the individual freedom to explore anything I want, like a big buffet, <laughs> right? And often, at the end of the day, there's not a deep communal dimension to that. It's just about one's individual preferences and tastes. And that can be isolating and alienating, actually, in interesting ways, and liberating. <laughs> but I think, I think that whole thing can be nuanced when you start to study religion scholar religion, so like obviously I think there's a lot of ways of understanding religion, that's one way. Um, so, yes? Isn't it that um, the idea that um, yoga is tied to religion is just because of colonialism? Because the British, when they came there and they saw these Indians were in the nature doing these poses, they think that it's religion, but for Indians it's not. Because yoga is like spiritual freedom, like you're saying, the flow, 
But then when when the British came in there, um, they said like because um, the imperialists they would say like they would go and conquer these places because they want to civilize and um, modernize the people. So when they came there and they saw these Indians, they would say like you are uncivilized, so we came here and you should have done these things. And then when they get out, they make it their own. That's why these days we have this um, skinny white women and white people doing these poses, which is like you cannot like see these poses and notice poses in, in Indian yoga, right? Some, I mean, some of them we can find, but some of them we can't. I mean, that was kind of why I wanted to end on this slide too. Like, how do you get from predominantly male practitioners in pre-modern India to skinny white women? <laughs> it's a good question, right? Like, if you look at Yoga Journal, every cover is like 99% of the covers. So it's like some white woman, you know, like in a beach, or just go to Instagram. How many Instagram accounts are just people taking pictures of themselves doing yoga poses in, in exotic places, right? So, um, yeah, I, in terms of how yoga became identified with Hinduism, it's it's partly the colonial gaze, you could say, the imperialist yeah. discourse. And it's partly the missionaries that were a part of that as well. So the Christianization and the anxieties around that. And so there's a kind of demonization happening of all Indian religious forms. Um, it looks like your brain, right? Yeah, they say that you have to study yeah, yeah. the, the yeah. all thing, all yeah. And so those superficial impressions from that gaze will then identify with it. But the, what's tricky is I mentioned that text from the 12th century that says you can, this is not tied to any lineage or any particular religious lineage or any deity. Like you can worship, you can be Buddhist, you can be Hindu, you can be Jain, you can even be a materialist. Um, while while that was happening. Um, there were other traditions that were devoted to Vishnu, that were devoted to Shiva, that were Buddhist, that did practice yoga as religion as well. So th that, those were both happening. And so it wasn't just a projection of religion on something that's non-religious. There was religious yoga. And there were, yoga was practiced for deeply religious reasons. Um, it wasn't, the idea that yoga was just a Indian gymnastics was itself a kind of colonial projection back on it, right? So, but it, it became more and more of like that before the colonial period, so it's changing, right? Like this is this is the key point I started with. These traditions are dynamic, they're internally, internally diverse, and there's many of them. So those things make it hard to, to account for the identification of yoga with Hinduism. But it's partly from what you share. It's partly the kind of missionary, imperialistic gaze. It's also partly Hindus in India claiming yoga for Hinduism. So the prime minister I mentioned, Narendra Modi, doing that, right? And so, and, and this weird thing is that if you look at the West, you have the kind of more progressive, open-minded, inclusivist tradition, and then the more conservative, religious right tradition, right? And the, the people in India who say yoga is Hindu actually agree with the conservatives. <laughs> and that's the tradition of imperialistic racism, right? And the people who say no, it's not, are these spiritual but not religious progressivists, <laughs> right? I don't know if that's clarifying, but <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't Hinduism kind of a, again a gaze that was put on by the British? Like these were just all these village, village religions, and the, the British needed to call it something. That's that's what we teach at least. So yeah. the I idea so. that it wasn't it maybe just was a practice that was part of the village tradition or part of your cultural tradition suddenly yeah. gets labeled Hinduism by the British, and then they claim it as their own. I don't know. That so does that make sense? Hinduism. Uh, it's a big. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I gotta like, I gotta do some yoga to get it ready. For this. I like the second post, please. Yeah. Um, there's a great book. 
I'll, I'll, I'll just say this. There's a great book by Andrew Nicholson called Unifying Hinduism. And so what he argues, uh, and, and, and then there's also another article, Who Invented Hinduism? Um, these, both of these are really important pieces. What they show is that, first of all, no one called themselves a Hindu before the 16th century CE. This is important. Before when? The 16th century CE. No one said, I'm a Hindu. What would they say? They would say, I'm a Shaiva, a devotee of Shiva. I'm a Vaishnava, a devotee of Vishnu. I'm a Shakta, a devotee of Vishnu. And they didn't agree, they were separate religions. There's a religion devoted to Shiva, a religion devoted to Vishnu, a religion devoted to all these goddesses. And then there's village forms of that, and then there's also courtly forms of that. And you know, like it, it wasn't just all village. You know, that there's like a civilization, there's courts and stuff, and, and cities as well in India. So um, those religions had more in common with each other than they did with Buddhism or Islam. They all looked back to the Vedas. They all kind of acknowledged the Vedas. And so though they were separate religions, though they disagreed with each other fundamentally and were not a part of the same communities, they shared more in common than they did with Muslims or, right? And so when the pressure of Islam, especially in Islamic rulers, came to India, there was suddenly this big religious other. And in response to that, what we have is this process of the unifying of these communities and seeing themselves to a certain extent as sharing more with each other. And the, the use of the word Hindu is related to the word Hindu or Indus, which is the river. So it's originally it was a geographical term, people who lived beyond the Indus River were the Hindus. So originally it had nothing to do with religion. It's true the British consolidated that process. They consolidated it by saying, look, we need to govern and control this place. And the way we're going to do that is through surveys. <laughs> what are you, right? You're, guess what? You're Hindus. You're OK. Now we can organize you. It's like a management strategy, right? And then they did another strategy, which is they divide and conquer. They divided Hindus and Muslims, right? And created conflicts between them so that they couldn't actually unify to challenge their authority. And those conflicts continue today in India. So, and then the partition of India and Pakistan was based on religious identity. Where there was a majority of Muslims, that became Pakistan. And originally it was uh, West and East Pakistan, but now it's Pakistan and Bangladesh. And where there was a majority of Hindus, that became India. A few places, like Kashmir, became a part of India even though they were majority Muslim. And that's where there's a lot of conflict. So um, it's a, what I call Hinduism is an umbrella term for many different religions. It's an umbrella term. And now a lot of people just think, identify as Hindu. And these are people from India, <laughs> from India say, I'm Hindu. So now it is a, an identity marker. But what's different about it than other religions is that it, the identity marker itself has a recent history. So I, is that helpful? Um, but who invented Hinduism? Because a lot of people say the British invented it. That article um, clarifies that it wasn't quite invented by the British. But it was galvanized um, by the British, you could say. That's an identity marker. Okay. And then I'm, now I'm remembering another thing Indian reformers actually came up with Hinduism as something to counter the institutions of Christianity and Islam. So they Absolutely. said, we Absolutely. are an institutionalized religion yeah. as well. So I don't know. I Absolutely. read both. Did the so British that's, coined it? And that's, the the birth, that's the birth of what we call modern Hinduism. And it was related to a, a, what's called the Bengali Renaissance. So a lot of the early reformers, they were absolutely instrumental in our in our current understanding of what Hinduism is. They were really instrumental. And a lot of that was in response to the colonial power, for sure. And it was related to, and yet, like with the muscular Christianity, they took ideas 
from, you know, they're responding to critiques about why Hinduism is backwards. And so some of them distance themselves from certain aspects of their own tradition in order to articulate a form. So, and then others went back to those forms. So there's a lot of things that happened, but that was really important. And so there's some really great scholarship on that process, the, the coalescence of modern Hinduism. Yeah. Is this article David Lorenzen is the author. David Lorenzen. Yeah. Who invented okay, thank you. Yeah, and Unifying Hinduism is a great book, too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's take a.